Okay. Well, very good, and welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Ted Rappaport with NYU Wireless, and this may be a first, and it's probably appropriate since this is the first step to 6G and above 95 gigahertz. I'm a professor at NYU Wireless, and we've been working on 95 gigahertz and above now for about a year, and I'm happy to present the work, which is the hard work of a number of people, a number of students at NYU, including Yunshu Zing and Shi Hao Ju and Ojas Chanhiri, who are on the call with me. This is a first because I'm actually on an Amtrak train, and I don't know how good the coverage will be between Philadelphia and Baltimore, and I know there's a tunnel in about 40 minutes, so this lecture will certainly be done before 40 minutes. Ted first, Rappel, I wanted to say thank you to the Millennium Red right. Coalition. The companies involved and uh, the NYU team have been working hard, and the FCC has been listening. Hopefully the NTIA is listening, and we have a historic order. If you look at uh, uh, the first slide, I just want to give thanks to the NYU Wireless Industrial Affiliates and the National Science Foundation, who you can see their logos, and they've been a big part of uh, our center, which helped bring 5G to the world through our millimeter wave work in New York City, and we're now working feverishly, as we'll show shortly, on above 95 gigahertz. I said this is a historic call because... Uh, as we'll talk about in a minute on the next slide. And Yun Chao, I assume you've sent the PowerPoint, uh, the PDF out to the entire center to, uh, to precaution the millimeter wave group. You'll see on the, the uh, slide that shows the electromagnetic spectrum, the various use cases and what we've seen historically in wireless. You can, there's a lot known down at the VHF and uh, microwave region, down where the wavelengths are on the order of uh, tens of centimeters and meters. And we know there's the visible light spectrum, which you can see the colors. And above visible light, we have the uh, ultraviolet and X-ray and gamma ray, um, which have uh, various uh, issues, health effects, because of the uh, energy in a photon, which can release the electrons. But there's very little known about terahertz, which is kind of that uh, region above millimeter wave. You can see. The uh, 300 gigahertz to 3 terahertz region is the terahertz world. And uh, the millimeter wave region from 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz is relatively unexplored, but there's been a lot of work done in the last 5 to 10 years. And the FCC, of course, got out in front in making millimeter wave available for 5G uh, with its uh, Spectrum Frontiers uh, initiatives, which have launched the 5G auctions, auction 101 and 102 happening now. But terahertz is where we're going to focus. Um, you can see that uh, we have uh, the millimeter wave range from 30 to 300 gigahertz, which has been relatively well explored, up to about 73 gigahertz. There's a lot of work in the literature at 73 gigahertz. And throughout this talk, you will see a number of citations given at the bottom of the slides where you can learn more. But um, there's very little known above 95 gigahertz. and uh, we're, we're going to present some of the recent work uh, and some of the promising applications uh, that, that hold promise for this activity above 95 gigahertz, which the FCC has been able. So just to put in perspective again, on this slide, you can see visible light, which is 430 to 790 terahertz. That visible light spectrum is ab well above the 300 gigahertz to 3 terahertz region, which we call terahertz. And, uh, there are a lot of applications which we'll now talk about. But if you go to slide four, it's worth noting that in the history of wireless, you know, going back 90 years to when FM radio was invented by Armstrong and to the first handheld phone at about a gigahertz frequency and Wi-Fi at five gigahertz, all the way up to today, everything really has been operating in that very bottom left corner of that spectrum plot uh, that shows frequency versus attenuation. That is, everything's happening down below 6 gigahertz. And so really, 5G is the first uh, wireless standard that's making mobility possible above 6 gigahertz, up to 30, uh, 39 gigahertz with the FCC auctions. And what you can see is that uh, we're now, for the first time in the history of the, the US, certainly, and, and probably in the world, we're now looking at frequencies above 95 gigahertz, above 100 gigahertz. And let's take a look at what happens at those frequencies. You can see that the atmospheric absorption due to the oxygen, hydrogen molecules, O2 molecules, 
they're um, what they do is they create absorption in addition to freeze free space path loss that increases with frequency. But if you look at the frequencies below 400 gigahertz, there's relatively little attenuation, only 10 dB per kilometer of additional attenuation beyond what happens in normal propagation in free space, which means all the way up to 400 and even 500 gigahertz, we'll be able to do mobile communications with very wideband channels. In fact, um, it's only when you get up to about 600 gigahertz and above where the atmospheric absorption kind of flattens out at about 100 dB per kilometer. And there are these regions, I call them whisper radio regions, where you have even larger attenuations, you know, 1,000 dB per kilometer, which is basically a dB per meter attenuation. Even at those frequencies, though, you can still have communications over tens of meters very realistically. And the benefit we'll show shortly is that you get much better link margin, much better, not worse, when you go up higher in frequency because the antenna gains for the first time in wireless can start overcoming this additional path loss, especially if you operate, say, at 220 gigahertz or 120 gigahertz where there's virtually no additional attenuation, maybe only 1 or 2 dB per kilometer more than operating at these sub-6 gigahertz. You can see that rainfall is always an issue, but the rainfall tops out and kind of flattens out at 100 gigahertz and above, so that once you get above 100 gigahertz, you'll not have any additional rainfall attenuation, uh, relatively frequency flat above 100 gigahertz. But certainly as you go from sub-6 gigahertz up to 100 gigahertz, you can see that rainfall does start to increase the attenuation typical rainfall rates of 25 millimeters per hour. A regular steady rain can induce about 10 dB per kilometer. But even then, at 10 dB per kilometer or 20 dB per kilometer, you're only talking a few dB over cell sizes of 100 meters or two. So terahertz really, I believe, is going to be this great bastion for mobile in the coming 20 years. The next slide shows that the FCC has really done something historic. They published the uh, February 22nd, the documents, and they're going to be voting on this 18-23, uh, ET docket 18-21, rather. 18-21 basically opens up 95 gigahertz to 3 terahertz. It's called the FCC Spectrum Horizons, and it's 21.2 gigahertz of unli unlicensed spectrum being made available. And also, they're thinking about mobile, licensed spectrum, mobile spectrum which I believe will happen. Let's dig a little deeper in what the FCC is proposing and what they will vote on on March 15th. And I'm pleased to say that I was invited to visit and present to the commissioners uh, the day they vote on March 15th. So I'll be in Washington giving pretty much this presentation and any additional edits I get from all of you to the commissioners right before their vote on March 15th. How's the audio so far and how are we doing? I'm ready to go to slide six. Feedback, anybody? Yeah, doing, you're doing great, Ted. We can hear you perfect. So. Okay, you can hear me. Great. Okay, so we're on slide six. This is the FCC first report and order. It's ET docket 1821. Let's look at what it says. And this just came out, uh, talking notes on this and uh, in February. Let's take a look. So on the left side, we see that the FCC, for the first time ever, is opening up the ability to get an experimental radio license above 95 gigahertz with a lot less pain and energy than has happened before. It's been possible, but there have been a lot of requirements. I won't go into the details, but basically there was a, a, a big approval process and NTIA would check it, and there are a lot of uh, uh, passive operations above 95 gigahertz. But what's happened is the FCC is now really for the first time creating rules above 95 gigahertz when there really were none before. So first, there will be experimental license allowed from 95 gigahertz all the way to 3 terahertz, the entire terahertz region. There will not be any interference protection provided for the experimentalists from any pre-allocated services. That seems reasonable. But there will be an interference analysis needed before the license grant for the experimenters. It's not clear exactly how detailed that interference analysis will be, but this is a really good move forward, and I give praise to the Millimeter Wave Coalition and those on the call for working 
and at least opening this up, because this is a first for the FCC. They'll be voting on March 15th, and I'll have a bird's eye view. You can see the order is that linked on the bottom of the slide, but here are some of the terms of the unlicensed operation that's also being allowed. That is, secondarily, in this ET docket 1821, the commission is allowing, for the first time ever, new unlicensed bands, think of them as unlicensed Wi-Fi, where there will be a 10 watt EIRP, 40 dBm average, and a 20 watt, uh, 43 dBm peak EIRP allowed. And of course, with directional antennas at these frequencies, you will not need a lot of RF power. So it's very commercially viable. And there's an out-of-band emission limit set at 90 picowatt per centimeter squared when measured at a three meter distance, which is certainly in the far field of any practical antenna. Now, here are the bandwidths of these new unlicensed bands that will be voted on in March. You're looking at from two to seven gigahertz bandwidth allocations. The 116 to 123 band is kind of close to the Japanese band that's allocated. You're looking at seven gigahertz bandwidth at 174 to 182. But the bottom line is there's four new bands that will be allowed for unlicensed uh, operation with significant power levels. This is historic, and I believe it's starting the clock for 6G. Just like Wi-Fi went to the meter wave before the mobile industry did, I believe we're going to see the same thing happen now. And on the next slide, slide 7, you can see that the millimeter wave coalition played a role in it. And to those companies that are involved for the first time, you can take a look at the slide 7 uh, and see the impact that the millimeter wave coalition has had. This really is a new world. It's a new era going above 95 gigahertz. And uh, while the millimeter wave coalition is small, uh, the fees are also small to join. And uh, it looks like we're making a difference early on. And now I'm going to uh, show you, though, that the FCC is a little late in the game, because on slide 8, you can see that other organizations in different parts of the world have already been looking at this spectrum. That is, in Europe, Etsy is studying the millimeter wave spectrum up to 300 gigahertz. And there's even a, a World Radio Conference 19 agenda item. So there's been activity going on. Uh, Asia and Europe have already talked the World Radio Conference in 2015. So it was really terrific, the FCC getting on the bandwagon and looking up at these higher frequencies. Now, I want to talk about the applications in slide 9, because this really opens up a new world. And I believe it's going to be the start of 6G thinking, the sixth generation. Does it make sense to even talk about 6G? Well, President Trump uh, tweeted about it last week. And indeed, I think it does make sense, because with this new ruling by the FCC, we're starting to look at channel bandwidths of 2, 5, 7 gigahertz, which offer completely new applications that haven't been possible, but maybe thought seemed like science fiction, but they're certainly viable today. Let's take a look at some of those applications on slide 9. First of all, the idea of wireless cognition. When you get channel bandwidth so wide, you can start looking at having remote computations and almost to the level of uh, perception and vision and, and approaching human uh, perception and do that wi remotely and then wirelessly control uh, objects which operate on that real-time cognition, such as robotic control or drone fleet control. Uh, having vehicles, even, that have intelligence outside of the vehicle, much more computation that might be possible today in a car or in a vehicle being done remotely and then radio controlled over several hundred meters. Um, and we're writing a paper and submitting it today to the IEEE Access. It's an invited paper, about 100 gigahertz and the move to 6G, which talks more about this idea of wireless cognition, also called by some as network offloading. But these wide bandwidths will allow this for the first time ever. Then you have sensing. The ability to scan such a wide band of frequencies allows you to determine resonances and pick up absorption patterns that allow you to detect air quality, find explosives, determine the quality of air, and also do gesturing where you have such small wavelengths that allow new applications that just haven't been available before, human gesturing being detected and implemented. So you might not even be touching your smartphone in the future. Then there's imaging. And we show in the paper that we're submitting today that um, you can actually see in the dark and see around corners 
with a millimeter wave or terahertz cameras, and high definition video becomes possible so that you could actually scan your world and use your smartphone, your terahertz smartphone, to see in the dark, to see around corners. And basically, you can take advantage of multipath and scattering knowledge and see the world and build maps of the world, 3D sensing. I call it a reality wireless. So the reality wireless, being able to determine your world in real time will happen at these bandwidths and these frequencies. Of course, there's communication, the information shower, wireless backhaul, and positioning. We're working hard at NYU Wireless on positioning and getting sub-meter and centimeter level accurate positioning that will be able to be done in the wireless access point. When we go to slide 10, here's an example of wireless cognition for drones or robotics or even the, the computation needed for holographic imaging and spatial cognition is done remotely and then radioed to a low-cost device, maybe goggles that you wear or your personal communicator. So if you look so, at slide that, 11, that, you can that, see. Ted, that, that's a quick can you comment. Hear me? This, yeah, Ted, I have a quick comment. Why this can't be done with 5G or 5G evolution? Why do you need the well, terahertz computation? You, you, you certainly can, it'll be possible, but the applications now will have a playground to work on in these unlicensed bands that the FCC is providing. So researchers, universities, companies will be able to use wide bandwidth frequencies that don't have all the infrastructure and all the, if you will, layers needed to try basic ideas. Just like the Wi-Fi band early on showed the world how to do spread spectrum with the 1985 ruling in IEEE 802.11, it took about five years before spread spectrum became part of the cellular industry. I believe that the FCC's historic ruling is going to open up these unlicensed bands. It's going to allow experimentation that eventually could come into 5G new radio, 5G evolution, but they'll probably find the, the major mainstay, these applications, I believe, will happen in 6G because it'll take seven to ten years before we understand them. So I, I'm on a train, and it's real hard for me to have a dialogue. I need to keep going before the batteries die and the coverage dies. So if it's okay, could I move on to um, uh, beyond wireless cognition and go to imaging? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now if you look at imaging, uh, this, is, this is a look at actual work done at the terahertz range. You see the references there. It's very exciting. Um, what you can do is you can you could do this at 5G millimeter wave, but you could also do it at terahertz where the beams are going to be much tighter. That's another thing why going above 100 gigahertz is going to give you more spatial resolution. You're going to have much tighter beam widths in the same physical area than you do at 5G, which you're going to have broader beams. So here you could do simultaneous localization and mapping. It's called SLAM, where you actually detect the environment as you go. You could imagine sequentially steering a beam pattern and building a map of the world, the surface roughness is where the furniture is, where the carpet, where the road is, real time. Because you can move things very quickly. Radial waves travel one foot per nanosecond. You can move beams in under a microsecond. So you could start doing, uh, imagine the amount of information you can capture and do slam simultaneous location and, and mapping. The next slide shows the communications applications that will be possible at terahertz, connectivity and data centers, chip to chip, on chip, replacing the circuit board wiring with wireless is going to be possible. And then finally, precise positioning. Look at precise positioning. This is some work at Arizona State. We've been working with them where you can actually see the setup on the use a synthesized uh, aperture. Yeah, I think we may have lost Ted, yeah. so maybe someone, yeah. some, well, one of, of the students. But we can actually detect through reflections the map, know where the user is. So the <laughs> idea of locating uh, someone very accurately becomes possible at these higher frequencies. And the next slide uh, on slide 14 shows the precise positioning that we've gotten at NYU Wireless. Here we're not assuming perfect reflection. We're actually using the actual measurements in the indoor NYU Wireless facility. We published this at Globecom. We've got new results. And you can actually use back ray tracing from the measured results and get amazing accuracy. We've gotten less than seven centimeter position accuracy on our 35 by 65 meter floor at NYU Wireless. 
This is very exciting. This will come for free in future wireless. And you can see on slide 15, these are the students on the call who have been doing this pioneering work at 140 gigahertz, which the FCC cited in its report in order, uh, first report in order. <clears throat> If you go to slide 16, you will see that um, here's a really important myth for those new on the call. I gave this talk back, uh, this slide, back uh, I think it was uh, September or October of 2018. And this is how the world right now thinks of wireless. Most of the world still does not understand the benefit of going up to terahertz or millimeter wave. On the right, you see that you get more loss as you go higher in frequency. You see that the 140 gigahertz in free space is 5.85 dB more lossy than the 73 gigahertz, which is more lossy than the 28 gigahertz. That's the common myth. That's the myth. But that's only a free space equation uses omnidirectional antennas at both the transmitter and receiver. If you go to the next slide, you see that actually the opposite happens. If you go to slide 17, you see that in the real world, if you keep the physical area of the antenna the same and you go up in frequency, you actually don't have that loss. You get that gain because the physical area leads to much better gain, more directivity. So you combat the freeze free space air loss with a gain factor of both the transmitter and receiver. I taught this in the millimeter wave book that I wrote with Robert Heath and two of our PhD students back a few years ago, but the world is still not caught on. You actually have less loss for a given transmitter power and a given physical area when you go up in frequency. So going to DeHertz is gonna give us a better uh, link margin, not a worse one. And you get the, and here's a, something also that's interesting, that middle curve on slide 17, that big solid curve is all the frequencies. If you keep the physical area the same at one end of the link, and use an omnidirectional antenna, which shrinks with frequency at the uh, other end of the link, path loss is independent of frequency. It doesn't matter what frequency you travel at. Uh, the freeze free space loss does not vary with frequency. So antenna gain is a huge win, and as we get up to higher frequencies, we get more gain in a physical area, which gives us more spatial resolution and better link margin, which is why the consumption factor theory a paper that James Murdoch and I published about five years ago, proves that you actually get better power efficiency by going to wider bandwidth at a higher carrier frequency. So it's not intuitive, and the world will come to learn that as they deploy 5G systems. So Let's dead. look at slide 18. It's, it's what dead. we're doing right now in NYU. Can you dead. hear me? Yeah, very quickly. So a question on slide 17. Have you shared these findings with the FCC, and if yes, how did they react the, to this? Well, presented on March uh, 15th. OK. So I you, guess I could. I could send a note to them. No, that's fine. I was just wondering if I, you've presented any. I presented any this in a talk, and it was at Globecom. I mean, it's in the literature. It was okay. in our Globecom paper, and uh, it's been in a number of talks. But I have not expressly filed this at the commission. OK. It's an important fact, though, yeah. that the industry needs to come to learn. Yeah. OK. Okay, I'm on slide 18 now. These are measurements we're doing right now at 140 gigahertz. We've published and our work's been used around the world in 3GPP at 28 and 73. Uh, it's in the NYU SIM uh, channel model for our outdoor work, but we have indoor channel models that are also being used by 3GPP. But we're now doing the same measurements at 140. That is, Yun Chao and the team are measuring the same locations we've measured before. So we're going to have very soon 140 gigahertz indoor measurements, penetration, path loss measurements. We'll have the world's first path loss models available at the uh, D band, 140 gigahertz, <clears throat> which is very close to two of the bands that the FCC has made available uh, in, its, uh, in its vote on March 15th. So that work's going on. And if you look at slide 19, we've done the first scattering measurements. And in fact, the wireless class of NYU published a paper, it's going to be in Shanghai at the ICC in 2019, that shows the direct scattering model. And we've got measurements that show we now can accurately predict scattering through the 100 to 1 terahertz frequency range. And these are scattering measurements we've done at 140 gigahertz, predicting very well to measurements using what's called the direct scattering theory. And this paper that we've published with Shi Hao Ju and the wireless team on scattering will be made public in a few days 
when we publish it, uh, or put it up on Archivex. Uh, but this is a very exciting result. We now have very accurate scattering models, and we're doing that work. If you go to slide 20, you'll see we're also doing penetration loss measurements for common materials. Uh, this is what the equipment looks like. And on slide 21, you can see results that we just published in December of 2018 at Globecom, where you see that at higher frequencies, 140, you get maybe only a dB or two more attenuation in glass. Drywall, it's about three or four dB more attenuative than uh, we have at 28 and 73. So it's going to be a little tougher to get through things at uh, 140 gigahertz up at the new frequencies allocated by the FCC. But the good news is we can overcome those additional losses with more antenna gain in the same physical area. So it does not look like there's a showstopper for mobile communications or indoor Wi-Fi or uh, 6G, which will go above 95 gigahertz. So let me conclude on slide 22 um, about this talk. We've uh, demonstrated the new rulemaking report and order that the FCC has proposed, and they'll be voting on in a couple of weeks. It'll be exciting to be there, and I'll present this work to them. They've offered 21.2 uh, gigahertz of new unlicensed spectrum with a 20-watt peak and 10-watt EIRP average. They've specified the out-of-band emission requirement, and they now have a new experimental license ability all the way up to 3 terahertz. Exciting times for the FCC. We showed the novel use cases that these huge bandwidth channels will provide. And we showed some of the very early work that's showing that you can do precise positioning. We can predict the channel. We can do imaging and sensing. And we're getting the penetration and path loss and scattering measurements that will allow wireless engineers to design and deploy these exciting systems. So let me go to slide 23, show a list of references on 23 and 24 if you want to learn more. If you're not a member of the NYU Wireless Industrial Affiliates Program, look at slide 25. We'd love to see you there. We have a deep dive relationship with the companies that are in our affiliates program. All of them are aware of this work. We work very closely with Nokia, Amitava, and Prakash on this call. We work very closely with Qualcomm. Uh, they, all these companies have had access and knowledge of all this work for many, many months. We have dozens of students working on 6G imaging, scattering, simulation, phased array. It's happening at NYU. And if you're not a member of NYU Wireless, and if you're not a member of the Millimeter Wave Coalition, I'd encourage you to invest in both, because you'll get a great return on your investment. With that, I'm going to put it on mute. I'm amazed the call held. I want to thank everyone for recording the call and being with me while I'm on the Northeast Regional, uh, heading from New York to DC today. And thank you all for joining the call. I'll put it on mute now. And um, we could keep recording, but I'll see if there are questions. Yes, yeah, thank you very much, Ted, uh, for this uh, very insightful uh, talk. So, and I think it's critical that some of his findings are presented to the FCC, which I think you'll do on March 15th, so which is, which is great. So uh, is there any question for Ted? Hi, this okay. is Anirban. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Anirban. Okay, hi, Ted. Excellent presentation and a lot of eye openers for at least for me. Uh, one question. Uh, I saw there is some band that is being opened by FCC. Some of them have 2 gigahertz bandwidth. Does it really make sense? Why will do you open a band with 2 gigahertz at such a high frequency? Any comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's great that we have bandwidths, uh, varying bandwidths. And of course, I, th I believe the future needs to have 20 gigahertz or more channel allocations to really do the kinds of things that will eventually allow human cognition-like um, wireless cognition abilities. So I'm hoping and believing, and, and you know, with NTIA and their response to our request to look at the ITU rule 246 to see if we can allow sharing. Um, Hopefully that will happen. But right now, I believe the bandwidths are allocated based on where there's belief that there's low-hanging fruit, that NASA and some of the passive observations and some of the military use are not going to be threatened or seriously impaired. So I think that 2 gigahertz may have just happened to be sandwiched between where there might be uh, easy uh, ability and little opposition. 
I think you could still do a lot at two gigahertz at these frequencies. Let me give you an example. Um, you could use relatively narrow bandwidth uh, signals at, at terahertz to detect motion, to do gesturing, to, to be able to uh, sense uh, things that maybe don't require such a wide bandwidth, but might be useful in uh, IoT, relatively low data rates, or sensing and imaging and gesturing. So while you can't carry that much payload in terms of raw communication in that bandwidth, and you can look at slide six to see what those four bands are. The bands uh, are 116 to 123 with a seven gigahertz bandwidth, the 174.8 to 182, which is a 7.2 gigahertz bandwidth, the 185 to 190 band, which is five gigahertz bandwidth, and then this little two gigahertz bandwidth at 244 to 246. I think it's great they've done that because what it does is while it doesn't give you a lot of raw RF bandwidth, it does move you up to 244 to 246 gigahertz. That's a spectrum much higher than uh, is really commercially viable today in any kind of quantity. And so what it will do is it encourages experimentation and product development. And so while the bandwidth payload is not so great, the carrier frequency is great. And you now have the ability without a license to operate there. So while you could question the usefulness of any of these bandwidth allocations for, you know, eventual mobile, it's huge that we now will be able to operate and try things and create systems. So um, that's my answer. I hope that satisfies you. Yeah, thanks. Ted. Anya, that really does. And Anya Ban, just just to add to what Ted Ted just said, uh, as you know, in the millimeter wave coalition, we've been advocating for a much larger bandwidth, you know, 20 gigahertz I know, and, I know, and above. I know, and, yes. Yeah, and so this is the first report and order by the FCC, and I think it's already a, you know, a, a major step forward. You know, we'll continue to push to get more bandwidth, and I hope in you know future orders we'll have you know uh, greater bandwidth than what's shown on slide six, right. which is 70 gigahertz. Sure. So. For Kasha's mic. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Ted, Ted actually uh, underestimated the, the power limits. The numbers he gave power limits were for non-fixed units. For fixed units, uh, the numbers are actually 82 dBm. So the numbers that Ted gave were for mobile, but for the special case of fixed point to point, the, the proposed uh, rules to be adopted next month uh, in, in two weeks. Uh, actually allow 82 dBm for fixed point to point. Yeah, Thank that's, you. that's a good point. Thanks Thanks for clarifying. Thank you. You're absolutely right. I had mentioned in the talk mobile, but I didn't put that on there. I, that was an oversight on my part. Yeah, what I have on slide six is for mobile. Yeah. Um, yeah I was thinking of the Wi-Fi, but you're right. The beauty is we could also do fixed point to point for, if you will, wire unlicensed wireless backhaul. Uh, up to 82 dBm, which is huge. Again, this is owing to the much greater gain that can be uh, had up at these frequencies. And that's going to provide very significant distances, several hundreds of meters. And we're working actually on path loss measurements outdoor and indoor on 140 gigahertz. Uh, and we'll be able to give you real path loss models very shortly. So that's a good point. Thanks, Mike. I, in fact, uh, maybe the students, we can add that, uh, you know, we forgot the word mobile, but maybe we could add the fixed um, the, the fixed levels as well. And and the uh, out-of-band is still the same, right, Mike? The out-of-band emission limit is still the same, as I recall. Yes, Ted. Right, thanks. Okay, thanks. Students, you want to fix that, and we'll get that fixed in Adam's recording. Yeah. Any other question for Ted? Hi, Ted. This is Gerhardt. So in our comments to the NTIA uh, for a few weeks ago, we expressed the Millimeter Wave Coalition expressed interest in looking at um, sharing between fixed wireless and EESS. And getting some uh, work done on that. Is that something that your group is taking a look at, or is it something that maybe the Millimeter Wave Coalition could help fund? Yeah, we're very interested in that. We're talking to a prospective industrial affiliate company, uh, which we're very excited about, which brings satellite expertise to the board of companies at NYU Wireless. 
we're very interested in that problem. We can work on it. Right at this moment, we're not, but we definitely could. Um, I do believe there'll be room for sharing and that modern antenna design, along with the uh, knowledge of angles and uh, how, how the uh, atmospheric attenuation works, that it should be viable. And we did challenge the NTIA and NIST to invest in and look at some modern uh, spectrum uh, uh, sharing ideas where the law of physics provides a natural attenuation. You know, the cellular industry has done that for decades. We rely on the natural attenuation of buildings and foliage and terrain to allow co-channel cellular to use to work. So it certainly seems like over distances of several hundred kilometers at frequencies where it's known that the atmospheric uh, absorption is much greater than at sub-6 that we should be able to do that with terrestrial systems and satellite systems. Any other question for Ted? Just make sure you unmute yourself uh, in case you're muted. So. Okay. So there's no more questions. So, you know, I would like to thank uh, Ted uh, for this excellent talk and insight into the potential of this spectrum above 95 gigahertz. Uh, you know, look forward to continue to work with, with Ted as part of a millimeter wave coalition and also uh, looking forward for other members to join. I could see there are some, uh, you know, some uh, people from uh, companies which are not part of millimeter wave coalition yet. So I hope this talk was interesting enough to to you know encourage people to join and then ted you know uh good luck with your talk at the fcc on march 15 i think it's going to be very useful for you to present these findings to the fcc because as you said there are some misconceptions on on the usefulness maybe of the uh you know the laws of uh, physics guiding these these bands above 95 gigahertz so so again thank you very much ted and i think we can we can close this this talk and thank you ted it's my pleasure, and thank you to the NYU Wireless Industrial Affiliate Companies and to the National Science Foundation, and in particular to my hardworking students, Yun Chao, Ojas, and Shi Hao, who worked very hard on this presentation and are doing some amazing work uh, above 95 gigahertz and even below 95 gigahertz with uh, indoor modeling. You'll see the new NYU SIM channel simulator come out very shortly with a very comprehensive indoor channel model indoor to outdoor penetration models and spatial consistency. And there's some new exciting uh, results and that will be published soon from NYU Wireless and all the affiliates see these as, as the day they happen. So thank you very much for caution, everyone for joining the call. Hi, a comment? Yeah, go ahead, a last one. Uh, hi, this is Mike Pettis with Bubik Network out in California. I wanted to, uh, my microphone was not working before it is now. I wanted to thank Ted very much for this uh, presentation. Very useful. I'm excited about the new uh, uh, report and order that's happening with the FCC. I would like to see wider channels. I think we all would. But uh, as a first step, this is great, especially since it's making use of the rules at 60 gigahertz. Um, and uh, this reminds me of the first work that occurred during the mid-90s when we formed the first set of rules for uh, uh, at the time, it was 59 to 64 yeah. gigahertz, in, uh, and so thank you very much, Ted. Good, good presentation. Thank you, and Mike, I hope to see thank you join the millimeter wave coalition soon, Mike. Okay. It's happening this month, believe it or oh, okay. not. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye.